Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate you being present and we appreciate you that's tuned in out in the radio listening audience. We most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up we can be an inspiration to everyone. And you in the radio listening audience, if you get on that phone and call a friend, uh, shut in and have them to tune in, we'd appreciate that so very much. Now if you have your Bible today, you turn to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. While you're turning there, I want to say just a word or two about our tape. Now, and I have about 148 listed, I believe. We'd be glad to send you a list of these cassette tapes if you write in for the list because there may be some that you'd like to write in again. We also have our beautiful calendars now. They got lost here in town for a week or so, but we finally located them. And they're very beautiful. And we'll send these calendars out to you in the radio listening audience to your request. You're here in the auditorium. We have the, the calendars here. You come and take what you can use and place them where they can be beneficial. And they're beautiful to have in your home. I think it's one of the most beautiful calendars we've sent out in some time. And you be sure and get your calendar. And you in the radio listen audience, all you have to do is just request it. Say, Preach Edward, send me the calendar. We'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. And you can even request it in your Christmas card. At this particular time of the year, we have people that think about us, and we appreciate that. They send us beautiful Christmas cards. You don't have to write an extra letter or a card in order to get the calendar. Just uh, uh, just say, preach every send me the calendar. Put that in your Christmas card. And, of course, if you'll do that, well, we'll be glad to get the calendar right in the mail to you. Remember, this is a faith ministry. We depend entirely upon you that love God to help us keep the program on the air. The tape we send out for $3 of each tape, the money is used to help take care of the radio expense. And so you keep this in mind, and we appreciate it very much. Now, time is fast running out for you to get your name on our forthcoming trip to the Holy Land. The Lord willing, we're planning to make trip number 12 in March. But there's many things you have to do. You have to get your passport and various other things that you must take care of. And now is the time to do something about it. After just a very short period of time, we won't be saying any more about it. I'm sure some of our members here in the church will be glad about that. We we'll always have uh, listeners in the radio listening audience for the first time, and that's why we like to make mention of it. I'll be delighted to send you a brochure on this forthcoming trip. It tells you where we'll be going. We'll be going, first of all, into Jordan. Amon Jordan is where we'll land when we leave New York. Amon Jordan is the place where uh, Uriah was killed. You know, David sent Uriah to the battlefront, and there he was killed on the battlefront. And that'll be the place where we'll land, that Amon Jordan. And then after we leave there, we'll go over into Israel. We'll go down to the uh, old city of Jericho. We'll go to the Dead Sea. The Salt Sea, we go to Masada, and then of course we'll be traveling to different places in Israel. We'll take a ride on the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and then we'll uh, uh, go to Mount Calvary. We'll go to the empty tomb and the upper room, a Lazarus grave, many other places. The, the uh, birthplace of Christ, we'll visit the cave where Christ was born. After we leave Israel, we'll go down into Egypt. And there we'll visit the pyramids, one of the great wonders of the world. We'll visit the Sphinx and we'll visit a museum that contains hundreds of very expensive items that they took out of the tomb of old King Tut. In fact, they have a golden coffin there. They put their mummies in in those days, especially King. We see those golden chariots and golden coffins. And, and it's, uh, that museum would be well worth your trip along. It's very uh, educational. And we see the Nile River where Moses was found in the bull rush. We visit the place where Mary and Joseph went with Jesus when they fled from Bethlehem to go down into Egypt. Well, it's a real trip of a lifetime. And wouldn't it be good if some of you listen to me today that's not in your church would go next Sunday and get the group together and just say we're going to send our pastor and his wife to the Holy Land for a Christmas 
uh, present. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it be nice if some of your adults would send your parents that's reached retirement age has never traveled for a Christmas gift, just send them to the Holy Land? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, it's a trip of a lifetime, and you can't uh, compare this trip with dollars and cents with the knowledge of what you see walking on the ground where Jesus walked. All you need to do is request the brochure, or either call me or come see me. I'll get one in your hands. But now's the time to do something about that. I hope you have your Bible open at, at uh, Malachi chapter 1. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. You know, you have a lot of people that always try to evade responsibility or deviate around what they should do. I'm reminded of the man that said to his son, he said, Son, I believe it's raining on the outside. I want you to go out and check and see if it's raining. Why, well, he said, Paul, why send me out there? Just call the dog in and see if he's wet. So you have a lot of people always know how to get around certain things. But our responsibility to serve God and be faithful in serving Him as we sojourn. In Malachi chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, we find these words. A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have we despised thy name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? I accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. Now I pray you, beseech God, that he would be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. But be regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Far from the rising of the sun, even under the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense. I want to speak to you on this subject, the greatest man. Now, this tape will be tape number 157, the greatest man. Now, we know who the greatest man is that ever walked upon the planet Earth. He is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the greatest man that ever lived. All history centers around him. The whole world, whether they accept him or not, remembers three things about him. That is his birth, his death, and his resurrection. Let's look at eight important events about this great man. I like to talk about the greatest man that ever came to this earth. I like to talk about the greatest man that ever lived on this earth. I like to talk about the greatest man that's alive today. That man is none other than the Savior. Number one, let's talk about his cradle. Now I'm going to mention eight different things. I'll start with the letter C. And for the first one is his cradle. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 7 that he'd be born of a virgin. God said that many, many years before Jesus Christ ever came into this world. Isaiah 7, 14, some 700 years before his birth. The prophet Isaiah said he shall be born of a virgin. That literally took place when Mary gave birth to Christ in fullness of time. The devil has really tried to attack that verse of scripture and tried to attack the deity of Jesus Christ in every way he could. He moved up on the hearts of the infidels, the liberals, and the modernists. They had to translate new Bibles. And in the translation, they changed that verse to a young woman. That's of Satan. That's out of the pit. That was instigated by the devil through the devil's servants in regard to this new translation. All of these new modern translations is of Satan. None of them of God. They're translated by liberals and modern men today that ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth and know no more about the Spirit of God and Jesus Christ and Cal knows when Sunday comes. Have nothing to do with these modern liberal translations. 
If you have a Bible where it's been changed in Isaiah 7, 14, from a virgin to a young woman, immediately pitch it in the garbage can and buy you a Bible. Get your good old King James Version, the Word of God. It's not been tampered with. Micah told us where he would be born. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the Bible said in Ephratar, Bethlehem of Ephratar, there he would be born. Now there's two Bethlehems in Israel, and this one is the Bethlehem of Ephratar. That's where Christ was born. And Micah, the great prophet of God, many, many years before that birth took place, told us where he would be born. Luke told of his, of his birth that a manger would be his cradle. So in speaking about his cradle, let's find out what it is. The Bible said it would be a manger. Now you know what a manger is. You know what a feeding trough is. I was born and reared on a farm and lived there almost 17 years on the farm. And I know what a manger is. I know what a feeding trough is. I know what my parents fed the horses and the cattle in. Well, when Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, and uh, she was great with child, and the time had come for him to be born. And they went to the motel of the hotel of the inn, they called in those days, and asked permission to get a room. Joseph said, my wife's expecting a child, and we need a room. We need a, a place for this child to be born. And the innkeeper said, I'm sorry, sir, we have no room in the inn, but there's a stable out there. Uh, where people keep their animals. If you want to go out there, there's an empty stable there. You can go and that'll be available. And so Joseph took Mary and they went out to this cow stable and there they, uh, Christ was born. And the Bible said they wrapped him in swaddling clothes and placed him in a manger. That was his cradle. Now this day and time, when infants come into the world, they have most beautiful little cradles and what not to place them in. But not in the days of Jesus. He had no cradle, but was, a manger was used. Isaiah told us his name would be wonderful. And someday he said the government would be upon his shoulder. Now that time has not come yet when the government would be upon his shoulder. That time is yet in the future. That will be when he comes back and sets up his kingdom and reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. So we see number one, his cradle. The greatest man that ever lived was placed in a manger for a cradle. Number two, notice his character, will you please? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, there was no guile found in his mouth. Nowhere did Jesus ever say anything that was uh, unruly or we might say of a filthy conversation. No time was any guile ever found in his mouth. Every word he ever spoke was pure, was holy and was wholesome. The Son of God never said anything, never told a filthy joke, never said anything that would you could call guile that came from his lips. No time while he was up on the earth. He always spoke gracious and kind words, was loving and kind and spoke with authority. Jesus said whenever he betrayed him, Judas his character said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. Judas said he was an innocent man. He should have known because he lived with him almost three and a half years, ate by his side, slept by his side, walked by his side, saw what he did many, many times the way of performing miracles. And Judas said he was innocent. Simon Peter listened very closely at every word that he heard Jesus speak in no time did he ever speak any guile. Now Simon Peter was an old cussing fisherman. Before he got saved, he probably cussed about every breath. Now you've seen poor lost sinners like that. They just blank and blank, blank and blank and blank, cussing about every breath, every other breath, and sometimes women. You know, there used to be a time when you never hear a woman curse, take God's name in vain. But today you have many, many foul-mouthed women and sometimes more foul-mouthed than a bunch of men. Now that's bad. That, that's a reflection on womanhood. I never heard my mother take God's name in vain, not one time. Never did my mother take God's name in vain. I knew anything about it. I don't think she ever did. I've never heard either one of my grandmothers take God's name in vain. Not a one of them. Beloved, they didn't do that. Back in those days, women had more respect than to take God's name in vain. But you get a bunch around a bunch of these cussing women today that's cussing and carrying on. You say womanhood is stooped very low. 
And then little children, two and three and four and five years old, where their parents sit around and curse and take God's name in vain. And they pick those words up and then they go out cussing. When they're just little things, that's pitiful, that's pathetic. You know who God's going to hold responsible for that? The dad and the mother that use his name in vain before those children that caused them to do that. They are going to answer God for it in the day of judgment. Pilate said seven times, I find no fault in Jesus. Seven times the governor said, I can't find anything wrong with this man. And then Jesus himself said, now said, which one of you can convince me of sin? Which one of you can put your finger on anything that I did wrong? Which one of you? Go ahead. Nobody was able to do that because nobody ever saw Jesus do anything wrong, ever hear him say anything wrong. Jesus Christ was perfect from the manger out to the grave. Nobody heard him say anything wrong. That was his character. Number three, his consecration. Now he knew he was born to die. I like that song they sang, born to die. Jesus knew that. When Jesus stepped down from heaven's glory, he came down this earth knowing that he was to be born of a virgin and knowing he was born to die. He knew his time was limited on the earth and he knew he would not die until that time came. He said, not my will, but thine be done. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, there in the garden of Gethsemane when he was facing Calvary, then he said, the Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, nevertheless, thine be done. So he knew that. Jesus Christ knew it before he came to the earth. Number four, notice his control. The Son of God had perfect control. He had control over sickness. If you read Mark, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16, you find that Jesus went around and healed all manner of sickness. He didn't call some of them and heal some and, and then uh, uh, cast some aside and say, you don't have any faith. He didn't do that. He was God. He healed all man of sickness. You have these healing racketeers today that's making merchandise of poor ignorant people pertaining to uh, spiritual things that'll uh, try to get you healed by degrees and, and stick the finger in your ears and pop you in the forehead with an open hand and, and take your crutches away from you and, and try to get you to walk and try to teach you to say certain words. Beloved, that's not of God. That's of man. Much of that is satanic. And those heathen racketeers are doing nothing in the world but making merchandise of poor sick people that don't know any better because people are so gullible when it comes to the matter of religion. And especially if they're sick, they'll do almost anything to get well. And so these healers you have today are charlatans. They're racketeers. They're not of God. They have not the gift of healing. Don't let them deceive you. And poor people write to them. They'll write and send you all kind of rags and twigs and things that claim they brought from the Holy Land for healing and all that kind of junk. That, beloved, is just a scheme to get your money. If you're wise, you won't send it to them. But you have so many gullible people a day that fall for that kind of stuff. And these healing racketeers take them for a ride and, and uh, prune their trees for them. Now you need to realize that's not of God. But when Jesus was up on the earth, he healed people. I mean, he healed them. He called none of them. He had control over sickness. He had control over nature. Even he rebuked the winds, and the winds stopped blowing. And he stopped blowing. He said to the sea, calm down, and the waves calm down. Jesus had control over nature, and he had control over the devil. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, when the devil came tempting him, he had Complete control over the devil. He just put the word of God to him and like pouring hot lead in his boots and the devil had to shut up and take off. Jesus had control over the devil and he had control over death. When he came on the scene in John chapter 11, he found that Lazarus had been in the grave four days. The time for his body to decay. No doubt they thought it started decaying. And Jesus came on the scene and he'd been there four days. And Jesus said, I want you to get that uh, stone out of the mouth of that cave. In those days, they'd bury people many times back in a cave and put a stone over the front of it. He said, now take the stone away from that cave. I've been in that tomb. I've been at that entrance. I know what it looks like. And they moved the stone out of the way. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. 
Jesus called him by name. Had he not called him by name, probably everybody in the graveyard had jumped up. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of that grave. Jesus had control over death. Number five, notice his coronation. Now in, in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, the old prophet Isaiah said there's coming a time when your Messiah will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now that's Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. When Jesus came to the earth just before his crucifixion, he started riding in on a donkey. They said, your king cometh in. He's coming in. It's coronation time, they said. But whenever he came in, they rejected him. They rejected him. They put him to death. They crucified him. But when he comes back again, he will set up that kingdom and rule and reign upon the earth for a thousand years. So he came in instead of crowning him with gold, they crowned him with a crown of thorns. They said he claimed to be a king and a king should have a crown. And so there they uh, made a crown out of sharp thorns and they took that crown and they placed it down on the head of Jesus. They did that, no doubt, with much force and those thorns penetrated into his scalp and blood began to trickle down his face as he stood there with those thorns around his head, a crown of thorns. And so we see then he was not uh, recognized as king at that time, but he will be in due time. Then we come to number six, and that is his crucifixion. Now there's much to be said about his crucifixion. Matthew chapter 27. Did you know that Jesus Christ fulfilled 333 prophecies when he came? He fulfilled them literally and minutely. Many of them fulfilled around that cross. Old Testament prophecies the Son of God fulfilled when he came to the earth the first time. You better believe this book is God's book. You better believe that Jesus Christ was God's Son. But they crucified him. There they nailed him to a cross. The Son of God was literally nailed to an old rugged cross. That was one of the most cruel ways that you could put a man to death in those days. Back in 70 AD, whenever Titus the Roman general came in and conquered Jerusalem, they crucified so many of those Jews until they ran out of wood. They couldn't find enough wood to crucify them all. Now you may say, preacher, why did they crucify them? Why didn't they uh, stick a dagger into their hearts? The Romans had their method of putting people to death. The Jews had their method. The Jewish method was to stone people to death. The Roman method was to crucify them. And you'll have to remember that the Romans had charge of Jerusalem at the time Jesus was crucified. And that's why uh, he was crucified. The Old Testament in Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53 let you know that he's going to be crucified. And uh, at that time, the Romans did not have charge of Jerusalem. And had Jesus been there then, that would not have been their mode of putting people to death. But see, God begins to move kingdoms and kings and rulers to fulfill the word of God. And before Jesus came, God allowed the Roman power to take over Jerusalem. And so they were in power when Jesus was put to death and they used the means of crucifixion. And there the Son of God was crucified. He suffered on that cross. The Bible says he was made sin for us. He died between two common thieves. That was the man on his right, one on his left. Common thieves that should have been put to death. And he died between them and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He didn't even have a, a cemetery lot. While well, when they crucified him, Joseph of Amathir, quite a wealthy man, had a beautiful tomb there close to Mount Calvary. And he came and asked permission to take the body down and put it in his new tomb. And they took the body of Jesus down and put it in his new tomb. And so he was buried there in Joseph's new tomb. Beloved, he was put to death, he was crucified, yet he was an innocent man. And he was crucified, he bled and died, and paid the sin debt with his own precious blood. Many years ago, there was a couple that were atheists. They said, if we ever have any children, they're most certainly not going to be exposed to the Bible or religion or God or whatnot. And there was a little girl born in their home. She began to grow up without any knowledge of the Bible or church or God and Knew nothing about it. And she grew up to be about nine years old. And one day she was walking down the street and passed by a rescue mission. 
She heard some unusual singing, something very different, so she tiptoed in and sat down and heard the beautiful songs of Zion. And then she heard the preacher get up and preach and tell about Jesus and how people could be saved and what the Son of God did and how he was crucified, how he shed his blood. And that stuck in her little heart. And when they gave the invitation, she went down and gave her heart to Jesus, was gloriously saved. When she left, she could hardly wait till she got home to tell mother and daddy. She read in the house, she said, Mama, Daddy, I got something to tell you. Said, I got saved down at the mission. Said, Jesus saved me. He died for me, shed his blood for me, and I got saved. Her daddy reached and got a big old buggy whip. And he whipped that little child. He cut up her little body. He cursed her. And he beat her and, and, sent, and almost killed her with that buggy whip. And uh, she went to bed that night and she was so beaten and bruised until she uh, took a cold and then uh, uh, contracted pneumonia. And she was about ready to leave the world. And she asked her mother, said, Mother, could I have a pair of scissors? She said, Yes, honey, you can have a pair of scissors. She gave her a pair of scissors. She said, Mama, can I have that dress I had on when Daddy whipped me? And, and she said, Yes, honey, you may have that dress. And she gave her that little old bloody dress and she took those scissors and cut out the most bloodiest places on the little dress. Mama said, honey, what are you going, what are you doing that for? She said, well, down at the mission, they said Jesus died and shed his blood for me. And said, Mama, I'm going to die. I'm not going to live. And said, uh, I, I want to take this uh, bloody piece of cloth of my dress and take it and show it to Jesus when I die. And let him know that I shed blood because of him. And there the little thing passed away and went on to be with the Lord. Now, dear people, his blood is precious. And he shed that blood for our sins. Notice number seven, his capacity. The Bible tells us here he overcame the grave. When they put him in the grave, he did what no other could do. He came out. Nobody can come out today unless God brings about in the resurrection, which he will. And then after he came out, he appeared to many. Many people, he appeared to no sinners. No sinners saw him after he came out. He appeared to believers only. He appeared unto them. And then he commissioned his apostles. He gave them power and told them to preach the gospel to every creature all over the world. And then finally, his coming. His coming again. I, I thank God for that. In John chapter 14, in the first three verses, the Bible said, In my Father's house of many mansions, Jesus said, I would not have told you. If it were not there, I would not have told you. And I'm going now to prepare a place for you. Now, Jesus is going to prepare, prepare the marriage chamber, uh, the bridal chamber for his church, a beautiful place in heaven for us. He's gone to do that now. And then he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, where I am, you may be also. And he promised that coming. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, he said there just before he sent it back to heaven, there on the Mount of Olives, and he began to rise back to heaven and started up. And they watched Jesus as he went out of sight. And all of a sudden there appeared two men in white clothes there by their side. And they said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus you saw go into heaven shall so come in like manner as you saw him go away. And so you have that promise. And then we have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18, we find that Jesus Christ is coming with a great shout. And the voice of the ark gave the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which alive remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yes, this great man, the greatest man that ever lived, is coming back again. And it may be real soon. Whenever that great sound reverberates out of the heavens that great cloud up there coming and you hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God out of the grave will come all of our loved ones that we're placed there then every saved person who's in the body of Christ and every saved person is in the body of Christ will immediately be translated and transmigrated to meet Jesus in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord we're living in momentous days and perilous times most anything can happen now at any time. You need to be ready. There's never been a moment any more serious than this moment. There's never been a time when you need to be ready any more than at this particular time. 
because you're nearing home and you need to know that. If you're lost, you're nearing hell and you need to know that and you need to get right with God. Let us stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray that you'll take this message, save someone in the radio listen audience, speak to hearts here in the auditorium. Father, if there's somebody here unsaved, speak to their hearts. There's a backslide here, speak to that heart. Our God, have your way now as we give this invitation. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie is playing for us. As she plays on the instrument, if you're here today wanting to get saved, you want to come back to God, you want to join the church where we receive members, or for any other reason, you need to come forward. Now's the time to come while Debbie plays for us. is speaking. I've given you the message. Now it's up to you to respond to the invitation. <laughs> 